All these people flooding in. <laughs> no. Hi, everyone. We're just going to take a moment to make sure everybody's here with us. This is so exciting to see so many people ready on a Monday evening. Let's <laughs> talk about contracts. Great. Okay, there's still some more people coming in, but um, I'll start uh, speaking slowly. My name is Brianna McGillivray. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight with us. Um, I am the Civic Art Program Coordinator with the LA County Department of Arts and Culture. And uh, we're super excited to be hosting this uh, workshop on the artist contract, um, presented and organized by Virginia Brojma. I'm sorry if I'm slaughtering that last name, Brojma, um, and Susan Schwartz. Um, so Virginia is a Los Angeles based artist whose work focuses on patterns of representation in figurative painting. Her engagement with the arts community involves curating, writing, collaborative projects and public art, along with her studio practice. In 2019, she launched the artist's office uh, through which she creates systems of support for artists professional practices. This involves increasing professional capacity by offering needs-based tools and opportunities to share knowledge between peers and professionals. Um, she has exhibited extensively in Los Angeles, as well as internationally in the various um, other cities in which she's lived, which include San Diego, Savannah, Chicago, and Santa Fe. And Susan Schwartz is a graduate of UCLA Law School, where she was a member of the Law Review Moot Court Honors Program, an editor of the Federal Communications Law Journal. She has a bachelor's degree cum laude from the City University of New York with a major in mass communications and journalism and a minor in art. Schwartz obtained a master's degree in art business with honors from the Drucker School at the Claremont College's Center for Arts Management. And her clients uh, currently include conceptual artists, graphic design, graphic designers, graphic artists, gallerists, and choreographers. And um, we'll be sure to share links to how you can stay in touch with them after this presentation. Um, so I'm gonna just pass it over to Virginia, who's gonna start us off and provide more of an introduction to the project. Thank you. Okay, I'm just getting this going here. Can, I, can you hear me okay and see my slideshow? Great, okay. So welcome everyone to our presentation on the artist contract, drafting new terms for 2021. First, I want to say a huge thank you to the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture for inviting us to present this program and to Brianna. I'm excited to get started and we have a lot we are going to be covering, so I'm just going to dive right in. I want to kick this off by sort of setting up the reason why we're here and who this presentation is for. So to get a little idea of everyone's experience with using a sales contract when they sell their work, we have a poll we're gonna do quickly. Um, Brianna, do you wanna see if you can launch it while I'm sharing my screen? Mm -hmm. So go ahead and uh, let us know. Give everybody a few seconds to, to uh, check their screen and fill out our poll. Give you about 10 more seconds. All right, final answer. <laughs> Did you uh, get the results, Brianna? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was sharing those. Yep. Okay. Awesome. 
So little um, close to half and half with more uh, having used them. Cool. Okay. Um, all right. So let's keep going here. All right. So uh, my name is Virginia Brosma, as Brianna said, and I am an artist. I've exhibited my work fairly regularly. Occasionally I sell some work. I've been at it a while, over 15 years, but just to be clear, I am not famous yet. I still identify as an emerging artist. I mentioned this because we are about to dive into a topic that would have seemed unimportant to me not so long ago. I didn't think I was successful enough for contracts to really matter. Contracts seemed over my head, intimidating and an unnecessary hassle. In fact, I myself and many artists I've spoken with have been afraid to ask for a contract in a variety of situations, afraid of being seen as difficult, afraid of losing opportunities such as a sale or an exhibition and feeling like we are not in a position to negotiate and don't have any leverage, feeling like we have to take what we can get. This is not a position that feels great to me. Certainly not after working professionally as an artist for over 15 years. My lack of getting agreements in writing has led to some unfortunate experiences, such as galleries offering discounts that I did not approve, galleries making sales without telling me who purchased the work and for how much, my work not being properly packed when moved or shipped and then damaged, not being provided with accounting for my sold works. So I was thrilled when I met Susan Schwartz and she offered to teach a workshop on contracts for artists through the artist's office, which, is, um, which I founded basically to share knowledge and tools with artists in support of their professional practice. Susan is an attorney and an artist and along with her legal expertise, she brought her interest in supporting the artist community to this workshop during which she walked us through how and why to use various contracts with the emphasis that artists should value and respect their work enough to want to protect it. The workshop opened my eyes to the importance of contracts, even for someone at an early stage of their career like me. Artists that are very successful and in high demand are also at risk of being taken advantage of and losing out on the benefits of their work's success and the increase in value as their career progresses, all because of the art world's widespread acceptance of systems that do not benefit or protect artists. Contracts can be a remedy for this. Having a contract simply means putting down what you and another person have agreed to in writing. If you've both agreed to it, there shouldn't be any problem with having a contract. If there is, it is a red flag. So what kinds of contracts might an artist use? Here's a list of examples that I came up with. A consignment agreement, a gallery representation agreement, exhibition loan agreement, speakers agreement, artist agent agreement, commission agreement, licensing agreement. But today we are going to be focusing on one type of contract in particular a sales agreement. We will discuss what a sales agreement or contract is, why you should use one or be prepared to use one in the future, what terms you could include, and we will learn about the history of artists drafting and using radical contracts and how using a contract can change the art world. While we are focusing on this particular tool of a sales contract, our broader goal today is to empower artists to use tools that will bring accountability and professionalism to the art world and for artists to become confident in advocating for the terms that they want to become standard practice in their professional field. Artists can do this in many ways, regardless of whether or not they sell their work. So this presentation will hopefully be useful to all types of artists. <clears throat> not only that, the ideas that we will be discussing today extend to everyone who participates in the art world, either as a buyer, a dealer, administrator, or some other professional. The art world is highly unregulated, lacks transparency, and operates within a framework that generally does not protect artists. By demanding better practices, such as using contracts, we can establish a more fair and professional industry. 
This past year has seen a huge uptick in people demanding change at all levels within the art world. Here are just a few of the social media accounts and a resource for even more that are documenting problems and inequities and demanding change. We want to work towards change as well. So Susan and I are drafting a sales contract to address an imbalance within the art world, particularly the fact that artists currently do not benefit from the increased value of their work when it is resold. A single artwork is one small part of an artist's career and work. The artist practice involves many activities that contribute to an ongoing increase in value of their work. Most of these activities, as most of us know, are uncompensated and often artists are not the beneficiaries when their work continues to be sold for profit. But what if artists did receive a percent of the profits when their work was resold? If you think that this is a radical idea, it is only radical in the US. Europe has an established resale royalty right that provides for artists to receive a percent of the sale when their work is resold for a thousand euros or more and has an agency that checks up to make sure it's being upheld. So far, there have not been any cases where an artist was denied their resale royalty. I believe that with more artists and art workers asking for protection of their rights as they identify them, these requests will become normalized. Creating an artist contract that can be widely adopted is one of the tools that can take these requests from being easily dismissed to becoming standard practice. I also believe that normalizing these practices and creating change will happen from artists at the early stages of their careers who can adopt these practices right from the start. And today we are going to discuss how we can do this. So before I pass it over to Susan for her part of the presentation, I want to invite you to open the, um, we're going to put a link in the chat. Brianna, would you mind doing that again? Mm -hmm. um, so this is a Google doc that if you wanna go ahead and open it up, we're going to use it as a shared notepad. You can jot down your questions throughout the presentation, your comments, there's a section for resources. Um, this is going to be a living document that we'll be using. You're welcome to use the chat as well, but this will be a much easier way for us to look through and really address everyone's comments and questions and keep an archive of today's conversation. We'll also reference it at the end when we have a discussion, when we have time for discussion. So I am going to stop my share and hand it over to Susan. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to start my slideshow. It's going to take a minute. Oh, there it goes. Look at that. First, the disclaimer. This presentation is not intended as legal advice. If you need legal advice, please consult your attorney. Thank you, Virginia. And thank you, Brianna. Um, I've been working with Virginia on a way for artists to assert their rights through their contracts. My goal is to make sure that artists are treated more fairly and are able to sustain themselves through their practice. I was an artist when I was in college. I worked in the post office to sustain my practice. I realized that this was not a sustainable future for me and that I would wind up retiring from the post office if I didn't go do something else. So I became a lawyer. It would be wonderful if you don't have to make that kind of choice as well. If there were ways that you, through your contracts, could insist that you receive a share of the profit when your work is resold for increased value. If there were a way for you to demand that you receive a share of the gate if your work is shown for profit at an exhibition or in a museum show. If there was a way for you to insist that you be paid an hourly wage for installing your work or for speaking about your work. This is what a contract can do for you. 
As I drafted an artist-centered sales contract, I decided to do some legal research to see what had gone before. And what I found was the Artist Reserve Rights Transfer and Sale Agreement, also known as the Artist Contract. This agreement was written in 1971, and it asserted artists' right to control their works after their works were sold. The more I read and the more I was exposed to authors and artists who have used and written about the artist contract over the years, I felt that I was on the right path and in good company. Next year is the 50th anniversary of the artist contract, a document which was revolutionary when it was drafted in 1971 by curator and artist Seth Siegelob and attorney Robert Perjanski. The contract was drafted after a series of public hearings by the Art Workers Coalition in New York and in reflected the needs and desires of artists at that time. As we approach this 50th anniversary, it's a time to revisit the artist's contract and to re-envision it for our times, to create a working and living con artist contract for 2021 and beyond. Seth Siegelob asked, a series of questions, but he viewed the artist contract and the meetings leading up to it as a sort of manifesto. And this is what he wrote, artists, there is no art without you. There is no art world without you. You have given up rights you probably don't know exist. Perhaps you think that you have freedom in your art but you definitely have no freedom or rights or controls after you make your art. The art world uses your art the moment it is made public. The critics, magazines, museums, and collectors use your art immediately. They trade their today against your potential immortality, your tomorrow, because they keep you competitive, because of quality, because you have allowed the sale of your art to be the only way to receive direct compensation from the use of your art. And so the questions that Seth Siegelob posed to artists in 1968 to 71 is the same question I'm going to pose to you tonight. What is the relationship to your artwork after it leaves your possession. Would it be possible for you to sell just an 80% interest and possession in a work of art and still retain for yourself 20% plus aesthetic and ex exhibition control? We'll call that co-ownership or owning the upside. Would it be possible for you to loan a work of art to a museum for a weekly rental fee or a percentage of the gate? Would it be possible for you to receive royalties on books on or about your art? Would it be possible for artists to control museums? Will it ever be possible for artists to even control the immediate environment in which their works are seen and known? What rights will you keep? What rights are you willing to bargain away when you make a sale? Just because you sell your work, it doesn't mean that your relationship with your work has to end. As we will discuss, the artist contract asserts that artists have rights in their works, which remain vital even after the work is sold. This creates a continuing relationship between the artist and the collector. More fundamentally, it ensures a continuing relationship between you and your work. Let me start with the premise that in order for you to assert your rights, 
you have to know what your rights are. These are some of the rights that have been asserted by artists through their contracts. To block resale for a term of years, we'll call that the anti-flipping term. To retain an ownership interest in your work, we'll call that co-ownership, or to be paid when your work is resold for profit, a resale royalty. To be paid for installing your work, to control exhibitions, to control reproductions, to disclaim authorship if your work is altered or modified, to be consulted about repairs, to periodically borrow your work for exhibitions, to receive rental income if your work is exhibited for profit, and to be paid for appearing to speak about your work. In short, you can demand to be paid for your labor at a living wage, and you can demand to share in the profits when your work is resold. How do contracts fit into this? Contracts are a vehicle which allows you to assert your rights and to control your legacy. I want to take you back to the late 1960s, to the time in which the Art Workers Coalition was active and the artist contract was being drafted. The civil rights movement was in full sway. Thousands of people were demonstrating for equal rights for Black people and for women. There was a war going on and tens of thousands of people took to the streets to protest the draft and racism. The social discord and upheaval, the insistence on equal rights and the public protests across the country are very familiar. We are living through similar heady times today, 50 years later. The 60s also saw the rise of conceptual art as in this image of Joseph Kosuth's work. Conceptual artists often use documentation in their practice. This documentation often included instructions for the construction and installation of their work. These contracts could become integral parts of the artworks. In the upcoming video from San Francisco's Museum of Modern Art, conceptual artist Hans Hake discusses the context of the times in which his work was forged. Hake considered his work institutional practice and some of his most significant works critique the museum world structure and benefactors. Hake was an early adopter of the artist contract. My generation, uh, towards the end of the 60s, uh, was very much affected by political events. I was uh, invited to give uh, a talk about my work, and I had to say, well, these works and what I'm involved in, unfortunately, does not take into account what happened the other day namely the assassination of uh, Martin Luther King. And uh, that was a shocking realization. And I uh, thought I somehow, in order to settle my own relation to the world, I have to take into account uh, in, within my work, also the, the social and the political world. I thought one way to break down the barrier between what is presumed to be uh, this secluded uh, and holy sphere, what we call art, from the rest of the world, which is dirty politics, is to bring that other world 
into uh, the, the holy place. One way to do that, uh, I thought, was to bring the news of the day as it comes off the wire into the gallery. I uh, had a uh, teletype machine that was hooked to the news wire of one news agency. And the paper uh, accumulated on the floor. It's uh, the big news of the day and of the week, of the months, and so forth, just as it uh, accumulates. And maybe I should also mention that I was uh, part of uh, what called itself the Art Workers Coalition here in New York, a group of young artists who uh, tried to come to terms with the social environment and also challenge uh, museums in terms of their policies. In 1968, the artist known as Takis, a sculptor whose work was in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, or MoMA, uh, led a protest at that museum. One of his works, Telesculpture, was included in a group show at MoMA without his permission. He wrote to the curator, demanding that the work be removed from the group show because the work was no longer representative of his practice. He asserted his right as the work's creator to determine how the work would be shown even though he no longer owned the work. When MoMA refused to withdraw the work, Takis and several friends physically removed the work from the show and as they did so, they passed out leaflets describing why he was taking the action that he was taking and demanding the artist's right. This was a catalyst to the formation of the Art Workers Coalition, which advocated for legal and institutional policies giving artists greater control over the terms and conditions of ownership of their work. The Art Workers Coalition held a series of public hearings concerning their demands. These hearings resulted in Siegelob and Projansky's drafting the artist's contract. And here you see the Art Workers Coalition in demonstrating against the war in front of Picasso's Guernica and also an, an original text of their 13 demands. And because it's very hard to read these 13 demands, let me tell you what some of them were. Artists should be paid rental fees for museum exhibitions of their works. Artists should have the right to refuse the museum showing of their work in any exhibition other than the museum's permanent collection. Museums should advocate for copyright protection for artists. Museums should inform artists of their legal rights. And museums should keep an artist registry for any artist wishing to register their works to show provenance. Some of these demands became part of the artist contract. So what else was going on in the late 1960s at the time leading up to the drafting of the Siegelob Projansky artist contract. Some artists like Daniel Byrne demanded a share of their profits when their works were resold. Byrne adopted the practice of requiring warnings for his works in 1968. These warnings were signed by the collector and prohibited the photography or reproduction of Byrne's work or of the warning without his consent, prohibited public exhibition of Byrne's work without his consent, required that Byrne be notified when the work was transferred or sold, required that any new owner sign the warning, and required that Byrne be notified of the collector's death and that the collector's heirs and assigns also signed the warning. The warning remained in force and effect for 50 years after his death. After Byrne's death, the warning provided for his family 
by requiring that they receive 15% of any proceeds from the sale or transfer of his work. If the warning was lost or destroyed, no duplicates would issue. And if any term of the warning was violated, Byrne would disclaim the work as his, thereby cutting off the chain of provenance and denying the, the collector of the work's value. The 15% royalty and the notice provisions made their way into the artist's contract. What else was going on in the late 60s that informed the drafting of the artist's contract? Well, starting in the early 60s, artist Edward Keenhold sold concept tableaus, which were ideas for works of art to be executed in the future. Collectors purchased the idea for the work and committed to pay for the costs of execution of the work by Keenholz. These costs included Keenholz labor calculated at the hourly union wage scale for skilled tradespeople in the Los Angeles area, plus his reasonable living expenses. His contracts reserved to the artist the right to determine when the work was completed, to freely reproduce the work, and provided that if Keenholz died before completion, the work remained in his estate. The tableaus ranged in price from $10,000 to $37,000, plus the costs of installation. By contrast, Keenholz Construction Backseat Dodge 38 sold for $5,500 in 1968. So his unexecuted works, uh, these concept tableaus, sold for almost twice as much at a minimum as his executed works. Keenholz contracts for his other works reserved a 15% ownership interest to Keenholz and required that notice of the contract term be affixed to the work. His ownership interest would be enforced by a lien according to his contract, and he was free to assign or transfer his 15% share in the work. The 15% artist's interest became a part of the artist contract, though it was framed as a resale royalty provision rather than a co-ownership provision. So out of this heady stew, protest movements asserting individuals' rights, conceptual arts focus on contracts and documentation, artists demanding ownership in their works, and demands by groups of artists for the, their rights, came Seth Siegelob and Robert Projansky. Who were they? Seth Siegelob was a curator as well as an artist. Many of the artists he worked with were conceptual artists, including Carl Andre, Lawrence Wiener, Saul LeWitt, and Joseph Kosu. He owned a gallery in New York for several years in the 1960s, but then moved to a more nomadic curatorial process where he would create catalogs and sometimes the catalog would be the entire exhibition or he would create books rather than having gallery shows. I'm going to show you a short video in Dutch from a museum in Amsterdam, which held a retrospective of Seth Siegelob's work. For those of you attending the presentation on your telephone, I'm sorry, there are subtitles in English, but they're only on the video. This video shows a number of people who worked with Siegelob during his lifetime, discussing the scope of his interests and work. Siegelob died in 2013. Yeah, um, 
set te definiëren. Hij was te veel. Hij heeft te veel gedaan. Hij had zoveel verschillende facetten en kwaliteiten. Hij was de man op de achtergrond, die eigenlijk op de achtergrond veel belangrijker was dan alles wat er op de voorgrond gebeurde. Hij was waarschijnlijk een wereldberoemde persoon geworden. Hij had zo'n gevoel voor humor. Dat heb ik nog nooit bij iemand anders gezien. We maken de tentoonstelling Overzet zie ik nou hier in het Stedelijk Museum, omdat hij eigenlijk een unieke persoon was. Hij is heel ja, bekend in de kunstwereld, maar er is nog nooit eerder een tentoonstelling gewijd aan zijn leven. En dat is wat wij nu gaan doen. Hij was natuurlijk tentoonstellingsmaker, maar hij was ook verzamelaar, hij was onderzoeker, hij was uitgever. Mm, hij was ook bibliograaf. Dus hij verzamelde boeken en maakte daar dan weer bibliografieën van. Uh, dus hij, hij nam heel veel verschillende rollen aan en steeds verzon hij weer iets, uh, iets nieuws. Om een uh, goed beeld te geven van de hele diverse loopbaan van Zet Siegelau, laten wij een aantal uh, mensen aan het woord. Jan Dibbets, met wie hij... Uh, Boeken maakte in de jaren 60 en 70, Jan Dibbets, beeldend kunstenaar. Uh, Cees Hamelink, uh, hoogleraar uh, communicatiewetenschappen, die Zet Siegelaup goed kende, vooral in Parijs in de jaren 70. Grafisch vormgever Irma Boom, groot bewonderaar van de boeken van uh, Zet Siegelaup en ontwerper ook van ons catalogus. En Marja Bloem. De partner van uh, Zet Siegelaup, met wie hij de textielverzameling aanlegde. Much less is known about Robert Projansky. He was an art lawyer in New York and attended several of the meetings of the Art Workers Coalition. He volunteered to help draft the artist contract and continued to work as an art lawyer in New York for many years. He later moved to Portland, Oregon, and was active in veterans' rights issues. This is the artist contract. Seth Siegelag stated the rationale underlying the contract as follows. The agreement has been designed to remedy some generally acknowledged inequities in the art world, particularly artists' lack of control of the use of their work and participation in its economics after they no longer own it. Here are the key terms of the artist contract. This is the resale royalty provision. The contract provides that resale royalties must be paid when the work is sold or transferred. The owner must advise the artist of the transfer so that the artist knows that a resale royalty payment is due so that the artist can track the work's provenance and so that the artist knows who the new owner of the work is. New owners of the work are also bound by the terms of the contract. Please note that this term may need to be revised so that the artist remains a party to the contract with future owners of the work. The artist is the record keeper and must be able to show the history of sales and ownership of the work. This provenance is important to collectors to show that the work they own is genuine. The contract provides the artist with control over how and where their work is exhibited. If the work is exhibited, the artist is entitled to half the exhibition fees paid to the owner. The artist may borrow the work for retrospectives or group shows for two months every five years. If the work is damaged, the artist has the right to be consulted about repairs. This can prevent the work from being altered or modified without the artist's knowledge or permission. The artist retains all reproduction rights in this work. The artist contract was written in 1971. 
five years before the 1976 revisions to the United States Copyright Act. At that time, unpublished works were not protected by copyright unless they were registered. Published works were not protected unless they bore a copyright notice. Copyright could not be divided and joint ownership was not recognized. And most significantly, the copyright for visual art was presumed to transfer with the title. This changed with the 1976 revisions to the Copyright Act. And now, in fact, the artist still retains all reproduction rights in their works, except works made for hire. The contract was printed by the School of Visual Arts and widely disseminated for free in poster form. The front of the poster discussed the rationale for the contract and issues surrounding its enforcement. The back of the poster contained a sample contract as well as a form transfer agreement and the notice to be affixed to each work. This is the transfer agreement and record. Each owner filled this in and was required to provide this to the artist when a new owner purchased the work. The sample contract also included the notice. The notice was to be affixed to every single work of art, or if it was a conceptual artwork, to the instructions that came with the artwork or the documentation. And this was to notify subsequent purchasers of the work, that the work was subject to the artist contract and they had certain duties that they had to fulfill. So the artist contract was published and widely distributed in 1971. What was its effect? Well, I can show you a contrast in the works of two artists one who used the artist contract and one who could not because his most famous work, which we'll talk about, was sold before the contract existed. Hans Hake used the artist contract throughout his career for sales of work over $1,000. His 1975 work on social Greece was sold at Christie's New York auction in 1987. Hake insisted that the contract be displayed next to the work prior to the sale and that its key terms be read during the sale, just prior to his work being auctioned. The work went for $90,000, which was three times its pre-sale estimate. And that was also the highest price ever paid for Hake's work at that time. Hake originally sold the work for $15,000. As a result of the artist's contract, he received another $10,000 from the resale. Robert Rauschenberg created his work Thaw in 1958 and sold it to collectors Robert and Ethel Skull for $900, 13 years before the artist contract existed. At the 1973 Sotheby's auction of the Skulls collection, Thaw sold for $85,000. Rauschenberg received no part of the more than $84,000 increase in the value of his work. His advocacy for changes in the law resulted in the California Resale Royalty Act of 1976. So what's gone on since 1971? How has the art world changed since the artist contract was first drafted? 
The California Resale Royalty Act of 1976 provided artists with a portion of the increased value of their works upon resale. The act was heavily litigated and was invalidated by court decisions in 2012 and 2018. The most recent decision, Close versus Sotheby's, leaves open the prospect that artists may obtain resale royalties through their contracts. On the federal front, Congress has repeatedly considered legislation to grant resale royalties to artists. Each legislative proposal has failed. Other approaches to securing artists' rights in their works have been more successful. The Copyright Act was amended in 1976 to provide that artists retain the copyright in their works after their works are sold. An artist's moral rights to their work has been recognized in limited form. In 1990, Congress adopted amendments to the Copyright Act, adding the Visual Artists' Right Act or VARA. VARA provides certain non-transferable rights to artists during their lifetimes. These include the right of attribution that an artist may be associated by name with their works and may remove their name from works created by another. And the right of integrity that an artist may object to any modification, distortion or destruction of their work and may remove their name from modified works. VARA has only limited scope as it only applies to paintings, drawings, prints, sculptures, and photographs in editions less than 200. While there have been no successful legislat legislative schemes for resale royalties in this country, at the same time, the sales of contemporary art in the secondary market have skyrocketed. Collectors have reaped the profit from these sales while artists have gained nothing. Emerging artists often have their work flipped repeatedly by collectors, tying the artists to a profitable style and denying them the opportunity to mature in their practice. The internet has made it possible to track sales of art in the secondary market and has made the art world somewhat more transparent. And blockchain registries of artworks allow artists to control the title to and authentication of their works. So technology will permit certain enforcement activities that were not possible when the original artist contract was drafted in 1971. How have artists today used contracts to assert their rights? Artist Alex Strada has used a version of the contract which is very similar to the original. Cadis Foundation has used a charitable version, which requires resale royalties to go to a charity. Christie's had a say it loud sale, which prevented flipping. Artist Cameron Rowland uses lease agreements as part of his practice. And Amy Whitaker, a scholar who speaks often about artists' rights, has espoused the notion of co-ownership or owning the upside and the use of the blockchain to enforce artists' rights. Artist Alex Strada created a contract based on the artist contract intended as an ongoing art project and re economic redistribution strategy that poses an alternative to the gendered inequities that permeate the art market. Her contract mandates that any collector must sell the artwork after 10 years from the date of purchase. All accrued value must be reinvested in new work by an emerging female identified artist. Upon transfer, 
the collector must work with the artist to redraft the contract for sale of the work and must notify the artist of purchase of the new work and provide information about the emerging female artist. All transferees are bound by the agreement. Strata's contract retains most of the provisions of the original artist contract, including the right to be notified of and veto exhibitions, the right to borrow her works for her own exhibitions, the right to repair or restore the work and to remove her name from the work if repairs are done without her consent, the right to receive half of any rental or exhibition fees and retention of copyright and reproduction rights. In June of this year, Canis Foundation revised the artist contract to provide that resale royalties of 15% of the work's appreciated value upon sale or transfer shall be paid to a charitable organization of the artist's choice. This version did not retain most of the provisions of the artist contract. Its purpose is primarily to distribute a portion of any increase in resale value of the work to charity, rather than a declaration of the artist's rights and continuing interest in the workshop, in the works. In response to flipping or churning of emerging artists' works by speculators, which has driven up the value of their works and denied emerging artists the opportunity to fully develop their craft, Christie's recent sale of work by Black artists stipulated that the works cannot be resold at auction for five years. The sale contracts provide the artist with the right of first refusal on all sales and 15% of all resale profits. This sale was unusual in that 100% of the proceeds went to the artists and it was curated by Destiny Ross Sutton. Um, it's a really forward thinking agreement and um, a real statement by Christie's. Since 2014, the artist Cameron Rowland has used a contract based on a boilerplate equipment rental agreement downloaded from Law Depot. The contract spe specifies that ownership is not an option. He refers to his artworks as equipment and the individuals or institutions who lease his works are referred to as lessees who must fill in a background check, check and make monthly payments. There can be no speculation in market value of these works as Roland retains all ownership rights and can re-lease them at any value he sees fit. Roland, through his lease agreements, challenges the expectation of ownership and the assumption that artworks are bought and sold property. Amy Whitaker has advocated co-ownership, which is a form of ownership which was espoused in the 1960s by Ed Keenholz. Amy Whitaker refers to this as owning the upside. If an artist co-owns a work, the work cannot be transferred or sold without their knowledge or approval. The artist shares in any increase in the value of their work a co-ownership agreement must specify the duties and obligations of each co-owner and should also provide that the owner in possession of the work must ensure the work. In her article, Artist as Owner, Not Guarantor, Not Guarantor Amy Whitaker proposes that artists retain 10% equity in their work in the primary market rather than receive resale royalties in the secondary market. 
she proposes that artists become investors in their own work. In a primary market sale, the artist would receive 90% of the work's value from the collector and retain 10% equity in their work. She notes that in other fields, creators often own shares of stock or stock options, which may reward them greatly when their creations increase in value. For example, the founders of Microsoft and Apple became very wealthy because they retained equity in their work. As an example of this, had Robert Rauschenberg retained 10% of the equity in his work, Thaw, he would have received $8,400, $8,400 as his share of the increased value of the work when it sold at auction. As you may recall, he received nothing. And now we're going to hear Amy Whitaker talk about owning the upside. Royalties are generative. Equity is generative too. They allow you to claim the upside that you've helped to create and then to pay it forward, investing in other projects. And if we haven't had this system, it's partly because the transaction costs of managing it have seemed too high. And this is where the technology of the blockchain comes in. So when I say blockchain, you might be thinking of the cryptocurrency Bitcoin. Um, and it's true, the blockchain is the underlying structure underneath Bitcoin, um, but it's a much more profound tool. The blockchain is as versatile and society altering a structure as a computer processing chip or democracy. It's a distributed ledger that allows us to keep track of any information, transactions, ownership, without a trusted central authority. If you think about Robert Rauschenberg, if he had had the option of issuing his artwork over the blockchain, before he first sold it through his gallery, he could have registered his ownership rights as the creator, and he could have specified 10% retained equity. When that work was resold at auction, the title would not have transferred until he was paid his 10%. So this is a fundamentally new way of looking at the structure of work and the structure of pay for creative work. And it extends far beyond the arts. It extends to any form of asking that we question, what are we creating of value and how do we share in it? Right now, most of us rent our time for a salary. And this is different. This is a hybrid rental investment model. This is about owning the upside as well as working on ongoing projects. So the idea I really wanna leave you with today is don't fear creative risk, embrace it, but own the upside. Think of yourself as an investor and give yourself permission and encouragement to invest in the projects that really matter to you so that together we can invent the point B world we all want to live in. Thank you. How else has the art market changed since 1971? Well, contemporary art has become incredibly valuable. And there's a lot of speculation in the work of emerging artists and flipping of artworks. For example, in February, a painting by Ghanaian artist Amoako Bolafo sold at Phillips in London for almost $900,000, more than 10 times its estimate and more than 3,000% of what the seller, Stefan Simkowitz, had paid for it less than a year earlier. The artist received nothing from that increase in value of his work. If he had owned the upside, if he was entitled to resale royalties by contract, he would have profited 
just as his collector did. So, leading up to our discussion, I'd like to ask you, why is a contract important now? What should be included in the artist's contract? What values do we wish to promote through a contract? What rights do we want to demand? What share of the profits, if any, do we want to claim? And how do we want to do it? The art world has changed since 1971. In some ways, it has become even more predatory towards artists. But in other ways, we are right now at a pivot point. We have new tools. We have the internet. We have blockchain. We have QR codes. We have smart contracts. We have ways to track and police the sales of artworks. We have ways to enforce contractual relationships that were not dreamed of in 1971. And so I'm going to ask you to help me draft a contract for artists that will be more fair and will allow you to earn a living wage throughout your career. Please tell me, what is important to you now? What rights should we demand? What rights in our works should we demand to have after those works leave our hands? What relationship do we wish to have with the collectors of our works? And how do we control our futures through the future of our artwork? In a few minutes, we will have a discussion about the artist contract and about what is important to you now? There will be some polling questions and a robust discussion. There will also be a document where you can post your questions and Virginia and I will answer them. But this is not the end of the presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Virginia now who will sum up and move us forward. Thanks, Susan. <clears throat> All right. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, I will open mine up one more time. Give me one second, everybody. OK. OK, so what now? <laughs> uh, we just took in a lot of information. So before we launch into the discussion, I, I want to offer just a step-by-step -step, um, introductory, which may answer some of your questions uh, before we get to the discussion, on how we can implement these ideas on a practical level. Um, and, and hopefully offer some tools that will make it easier. I'm gonna offer some suggestions, but this is in no way comprehensive. New tools are constantly being developed as people across the industry are recognizing the needs regarding these same issues that we've been discussing. So the first place to start is by asking for a contract. Whenever you have some form of transaction, this is a best practice no matter what the exchange, speaking at a school for a fee, loaning artwork to an exhibition, but just as a reminder and for the purposes of our discussion, we are focusing on a sales contract. 
So if you need the language of how to ask for one, you can simply say, I would like to use my sales contract for the sale. I will send it over for you to review and sign. By asking for an agreement, this begins to normalize the process of safeguarding both parties' interests. It shows that you respect and value your work enough to protect it, and it shows your level of professionalism. So we may have seen, uh, had this assumption that you would all know this and we maybe neglected it to say it explicitly. We are drafting a new contract for 2021. And so that's part of Susan and my collaboration. And when I say we are drafting it, she is drafting it, but that is part of the goal of this whole project. And once our new contract is complete, it will be available for any artist to use for free and to adapt as needed to their particular interests. Artists should not feel like asking for a contract is a big ask. This view, in my opinion, grows from a position of feeling disempowered on the artist's end. In fact, artists should see it as a tool for building a positive relationship with owners of their work where both are interested in protecting it, its value, and its legacy. With this in mind, you might ask yourself and really consider, are you willing to lose a sale if you cannot agree to the terms of a contract? What terms are negotiable for you and which ones are not? So you've sold a work, you have a contract in place. How do you make sure that the agreement is being kept? Uh, again, I have a few different suggestions. This list will continue to grow as new technology is developed. But so the first, first way is you could use a certification system for your artworks, such as VerisArt. This is an online platform that generates certificates for artworks and they're stored on the blockchain. This verifies the artwork and creates a secure record of ownership. So here's a painting that I added to VerisArt. It's free for artists to use, by the way. And now I have a permanent and unalterable record on the blockchain that identifies this painting. We are actually working with Verisart to work out a way to ensure that when an artwork is resold, the contractual arrangements are adhered to through using a certification process like this. So the other step that Susan also talked about is um, if you have a contract, make sure that the artwork is connected to the contract. You could do this by using the notice, the paper notice, like in the 1971 agreement, but we also have new technology like QR codes. And when I created a Verisart certificate, it generated a QR code and I could um, connect that with the actual artwork. Another idea is to set up Google alerts for the name of your work so that you can keep track of it on um, the internet. Uh, perhaps if there's an announcement about a sale or your work is going to auction and you didn't know about it, um, it's very simple to set up a Google alert, but it does have limitations, especially if you use very commonly um, used words for titles. Um, so it has some limitations, but it is a tool that you can put in your toolbox. Another way that you could make sure everyone knows that your work is subject to the contract is to have a notice on your online presence. Um, this is my website. So the contract that Susan is drafting that we're working on is called the FAIR contract, FAIR Artist Reserved Equity contract. So here's the language that I've put on the about page on my website. So this is a huge question. What do you do if someone breaks your contracts? And this one is tough because I know um, I'm an artist as well. Resources are limited. Here are some ideas. The first step is to simply ask them, please adhere to the terms of the contract. Send a letter, um, send a few letters, send a nice letter and then, I, and then a strongly worded letter. Um, but if that doesn't work, you could try something if you're comfortable along the lines of bringing attention to the matter through a public call out on social media. It's a great way to bring attention to a situation like this. You could consult a lawyer. You could also disclaim authorship over the work, meaning you can tell the purchaser that because the contract terms are integral to the work and they have breached, they, they have breached the contract, you are not going to say that the work is yours. 
So the effort to adopt contracts with resale royalties and other benefits to artists will only be effective if it becomes widely asked for and used. So we need to build coalitions of artists who want to grow this movement. Talk with your artist community and build a coalition to address the issues that are important to you. You could ask your friends if they use a contract and encourage them to do so. Organize a group of artist peers to help each other out with using contracts. Share which ones you use, practice asking, um, asking for them, practice negotiating them with one another. You could also connect with your city and state arts agencies to ask them to offer education around using a contract. Um, again, the paying for a lawyer can be pricey. Create a group legal fund. What if you organized a group of artists or a Los Angeles artist union that everyone pitched in for a legal fund that can be used as needed to help enforce contracts? Educators will be a huge part of the effectiveness of this overall movement. Um, if you are an educator here, you can start with telling young artists and artists at the beginning of their careers that they need to know about contracts. Um, I'm sure many of you, uh, if you went to a BFA or an MFA program, I certainly did not get told anything about contracts uh, in my education. <clears throat> it can be challenging to, um, to get established artists to change their practices though. So establishing this with artists at the start of their career is crucial. And the other thing that you can do is spread the word. Um, you know, share your experiences with using a contract or not having one with your, with your friends, with other artists, with your peers on social media. Uh, when you're negotiating a, a transaction, talk about your experience uh, in interviews. If you are, um, if somebody wants to uh, print something about you, anytime you have an opportunity to talk about these issues, it will help bring them to light and it will help more and more artists feel comfortable talking about them. And we can begin to build more partnerships. So I know I plowed through that and we're gonna pause here for a moment so that you can absorb all of those call to actions. <laughs> but we're going to we're going to move into the discussion portion. Uh, and just as a little bridge to that, we do have a few polls. Uh, Susan was mentioning there are a few polls we want to ask for your um, input on what's important to you in the contract that's being drafted. Um, just also want to remind you uh, that I'm going to be using the shared Google Doc to kick off our discussion. So go ahead and put your comments and your questions in there. The link is in the chat. Um, I'm going to stop sharing here. And um, Brianna, why don't we launch the, um, the next poll? Give everybody a few seconds to take a look at their screen and <clears throat> Is everybody replied that wants to? We're at 65%. There's 35% of you that we won't know what you want. <laughs> All right, last last few seconds. If you're if you're listening and want to uh, chime in on the poll. Okay, we've convince some people. <laughs> All right. Next one. <clears throat> uh, Lori in the chat said that she had to tap on her screen for it to come up. So if it's not coming up for some of you, maybe if you're on your phone,
Okay, a few more seconds, last chance. Interesting. Okay, did everyone get that last one? Give it a couple more seconds. Okay. Interesting. All right, uh, we got one last one. We, I think we can go ahead and do it now. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Sorry for the typo. That's my bad. So most people afraid it will turn away buyers and dealers. I think I hear that from a lot of people, artists as well, the fear to Again, you know, I mean, that, as I mentioned in the beginning, that's that's sort of how I came at it. Also, just afraid of, oh, is it going to seem like I'm difficult? Is it is it going to turn somebody off? And so, the contract that Susan and I are working on will be based on the 1971 artist contract, um, and we're we're really focusing on this use of the resale royalty to set it apart from other contracts, um, but we want to be able to include any other terms that are important to artists that they might potentially want to include. And Susan, did you describe it as a, a smorgasbord where you can kind of, you, you choose the terms that are important to you and you include them and you remove the rest. So you, if you really want all, all of these things are absolutes for you, you can include them. If they're not, you can take them out. So it would be adaptable to each artist's needs. Um, so we have a lot, this is the largest group we've had for um, a, a presentation on the artist contract. We've already done a few. So I'm gonna do my best to facilitate a conversation. Um, you are welcome to unmute yourself um, and, and ask a question. I think if you want to do so, you can turn on your video and raise your hand. You can put, a um, you know, put a note in the chat just to kick us off. Susan, I don't know if you have the document open or you want me to read some. There are a few questions that um, I think people wanted a little, a few, a little bit of clarification. Um, say, for example, on flipping, what sort of would be the um, the point of not having the work sold for say five years? Um, do you want to go into that in a little bit more detail? The point of not having your work sold repeatedly um, is that flipping creates an artificial increase in value for your work. Um, and if you start just creating, because the, the financial incentives can be huge, to just stay in the same style and not mature as an artist because your work is increasing rapidly in value and everybody likes what you're doing right now. But that can really stunt your career. So a lot of artists have said, 
no, we don't want our work to be flipped. Um, we want the collector to be someone who actually is interested in me as an artist and in my development at my own pace. So they're limiting the period of time. They're actually requiring collectors to hold their work for some period of time, whether it's a year or five years. Give themselves some breathing room to produce additional work and to grow. Thanks. So there's another question from Chelsea. When a gallery sells a work with a discount without making the artist aware, what should happen? And um, so that's one question. And another question about if a painting is undersold without the artist's knowledge, um, maybe you can talk a little bit about what the responsibilities of the gallery, um, the dealer, the gallerist should do. I mean, supposedly really, unless something is in writing, it's pretty hard to hold to, which is hopefully if you walk away with one thing from this workshop, it's get it in writing. <laughs> if you have an agreement, if you have any type of understanding with somebody that you have a business relationship with, whether it's your dealer, whether it's a, a buyer of your work, um, unless you have it in writing, it makes it very difficult to go back and enforce. I second that. Um, it's really important when you're consigning your work to a gallery to have an agreement with them. Um, number one, it protects you um, if your work is damaged, if your work is destroyed, um, if the gallery goes bankrupt. Um, these are all horrible things that have happened to artists in the past. Um, I think there's a great inequality in bargaining position between artists who are seeking representation, especially at the beginning of their careers and established galleries. And having a contract allows you to protect yourself. In a contract, you can stipulate that any price reductions below 25% of your agreed upon sales price for a, a, a artwork have to be run by you, that it can't be done without your knowledge and permission. There are certain standard discounts which gallerists will give to good collectors. You should talk about that with your gallery when you enter into the relationship with them so you're not surprised when it happens. But that's part of what having a contract is. It's talking about things, learning what the people you're dealing with expect is the normal way that they do business and seeing if you want to agree to do business that way. Um, I think the more you know about the people who you're entering into a relationship with and how they operate, the more likely you are to be treated fairly in that relationship, whether it's a marriage a boyfriend girlfriend relationship or an artist gallerist relationship it also helps just to make sure that you one person may be saying one thing and you are hearing another <laughs> and you know you think you're saying the same thing but that may not always be the case um so there's uh, there was a comment or a question from jennifer i know you asked this early on the presentation and i touched on it a little bit but we can go back to it just because it is such a huge um, concern for artists. How do you enforce a contract when you don't have a lot of resources? Um, you know, the idea of hiring a lawyer is um, scary or just out of, seems out of the question for many artists. Um, again, there's, you know, you can seek legal help. There's um, the volunteer California Lawyers for the Arts um, is a resource, but, you know, I think and this is, you know, 
just a, again, a list of ideas, but there are these other avenues that you can try. And a lot of them stem from building a coalition with artists. If you all speak to these issues and recognize that many problems are happening with your artist peers and friends and artists who you might think are much further along and have everything going for them. Um, it's just so frequent and it's so common for artists to not know how to navigate a situation and what really they can ask for. And they're afraid to, cause they're gonna, they're afraid of ruining a relationship or losing out on an opportunity. So, you know, so starting to build these coalitions with your artist peers, um, you know, if, if, it's, if it's comfortable to you and being vocal on social media and spotlighting somebody who's a bad actor and just doing something inappropriately with your work and treating you poorly that is available to us that they didn't have in 1971. Um, you know, that's why I mentioned all those institutional call outs. It's change is happening. And that's one of the, that is a really effective way to go about it. Um, Susan, do you have any other resources for enforcing contracts that you want to mention? I think each state has at least one art law organization um, that can, that has resources for artists at low or no fee, depending on the artist's ability to pay. In California, it's California Lawyers for the Arts. They're in San Francisco. Um, they have lawyers all over the state who work with them. And I would consider them as a good resource. As far as form contracts, you can find contracts online. I know that GIST, G-Y-S-T, has a um, artist gallerist contract that's very good. Um, there's another resource, um, a surprisingly interesting book about contracts by Sarah Conley Odenkirk that's very good and walks you through all of the basic terms. That's at the beginning of the relationship when the relationship falls apart and you need to consult a lawyer, I would suggest getting a hold of California Lawyers for the Arts if you're in California. Otherwise, look up um, art law for your jurisdiction. So I'm going through and I see that there's, there's an interesting question about somebody who um, makes work in an artist residency where there's an agreement about percentages um, and um, I'm sorry, I'm, re -re I'm reading while I'm talking. So, but um, there was a, part of the question was about knowing who the buyer of the work is. And so this is a, this is like a hot button topic I've realized for um, many people uh, is disclosing who the owner of an artwork is. Um, there are some people that are really resistant to this idea that the artist should know who owns their work. Um, I thought, you know, because I see like there's the um, collection section on your CV that you just would always be told when your work is in somebody's collection and you get to add it to your CV. But that's not always the case. And a lot of um, there's this fear, I'm not sure who started it, but that artists are going to go and steal the collectors and cut out the middleman of the galleries if artists know who purchases their work. So this is a big issue that um, is one of the things we're talking with a lot of people about and figuring out um, how to change this perception that there's some sort of threat when artists and collectors um, and their dealers are, are all aware of who is party to the transaction. So I just kind of wanted to acknowledge that because I think that's come up in a few different places and questions that that is a hurdle. I personally think that the artist should should be able to know who the owner is because I just want to know where my work is so that you know, if I they need, I think that it's there's there's benefits if the if the, again, this could be a term in the contract, if, if the, a repair is needed, the artist is probably the best person to do the repair. So if the owner and the artist have some form of relationship, even if it's just knowing who's who owns what, um, to me, I see that as a, a really positive, but there are some, there's some resistance to that in the art world. <laughs> um, anything to add, Susan? Yes, I do. In Europe for sales over a thousand euros, there's a requirement that the purchaser and seller 
be disclosed. It's anti-money laundering legislation, and that's go probably going to be adopted in the United States in the next year. So if your work sells for whatever the equivalent is of a thousand euros, say a thousand dollars or a little more, um, this notion that you're that the purchaser of your work, the collector, cannot be disclosed is is going to be unlawful. It will the purchaser of an artwork will have to be disclosed, whether to the public. That's a question that's still open, but definitely um, to banks and to uh, regulatory authorities. So once you see that notion of collector privacy and secrecy being chipped away at, it's much more likely that artists will also be privy to that information. It's like the person who should have the most knowledge about who their collectors are um, is like the last person to be considered. <laughs> yeah, and it just, the, the idea that artists are the ones who are gonna be paved poorly in the relationship really really bugs me. <laughs> um, there's a question related to that about if, if that happens, um, would it be able to, if that law was uh, about disclosing the buyer, would that be able to be applied retroactively? No, no. it's perspective. Um, so there, somebody had a question about um, an artist having control over the final presentation of the work of art. Um, if so, how can this language be inserted into a contract? So that was one of the terms of the 1971 agreement, right? <clears throat> yes. By final presentation, you mean the way the work is exhibited or displayed? That's what I assume. There's no name. Um, I don't know if the person who asked it wants to clarify, but um, that's what I would assume. Or perhaps installed in, if it's um, if it's purchased and has is in a you know a public installation. That would definitely have to be well. If it's public art, that's one thing that should definitely be in your contract because public art contracts are extremely detailed. Um, Brianna, if, if you're familiar with public art contracts, they go on for pages and pages and pages. Um, yeah, I, I was just, I was actually just reading that, that comment is great. Um, I, I think that it's definitely um, on the priority list to really re-examine all of our contracts right now. So, so thank you for that. I will, I will share that comment. Um, but yeah, they're, they're not fun. They're, they're like easily 50 to 100 pages and they do follow a templated structure. So a lot of the clauses, you know, are in there in every single contract they're decided far in advance of the individual commission and they don't change. But um, we have had a lot of uh, examples where artists have, um, you know, decided that uh, a particular term didn't match their, um, their needs. And so we negotiated further and we came to some sort of new agreement. So it, it isn't to say that those contracts are set in stone always. I mean, there are some clauses and provisions that we can't change, but there are many that um, are, are there because they're a matter of convenience, you know? So I, I would have absolutely encourage every artist to, to spend some time looking at their public um, uh, contracts um, or their contracts with public agencies and, and see where there might be cause to, um, to open up a conversation. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> there's a question about Siegelob's contract uh, has never been tested in court. How can artists be certain that the courts won't deem their contracts as unfair for the buyer? And to what extent can clauses be non-enforceable due to a restrictive covenant like Strata's 10-year non-resale clause? Well, um, that's very interesting. It's true that the artist contract has not been litigated. Um, however, it has been used by many artists for the, the majority of their careers. So there's a history of it working at least on a social level to obtain resale royalties for the artists who use it. 
it's hard to predict what the courts will do. I've, I've read easily 50 law review articles written about the contract. Some say it's enforceable, some say it's not enforceable. Each contract that you enter into should have a clause providing that if any term of the contract is found not to be enforceable, the remainder of the contract will still be in full force and effect. The same person had a question about for um, emerging artists, are there concerns that the monetary impact of this contract wouldn't be immediate? Um, so, you know, if we're talking about an artist's work being collected and this is for the resale that's potentially going to happen, I'm sure many artists here, and I would say this for myself, I don't think my work has ever been resold. <laughs> so it's a hypothetical benefit. I mean, there are other um, terms in the contracts, but yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that, that is part of it. This is one, this is one tool to address when the work is resold, um, how artists can retain some, you know, be, be recipients of some of the um, economic growth as well as, you know, the other, you know, I mentioned this in the beginning, artists continue to work and make, you know, make new work, uh, participate in the art world, uh, have an ongoing engagement with the art world and all of that is growing their work's value theoretically. So part of it is trying to create a system where they're not kept out of that if and when that happens. Um, do you wanna elaborate on that? Well, I think you, you said it very well. <laughs> well you know, one, of the, one of the other things, um, that you talked about, I think is very significant, which is if this becomes something that artists demand, if this is considered fair, if there's such a thing as fair trade art, which requires that a collector commit to paying 15% resale royalties and other terms because it's the right thing to do, that could really have an impact on the acceptance of the notion that artists are entitled to resale royalties. I mean, it's worked with fair trade in products. Why not fair trade art? And, you know, also the, you know, again, we're, we're talking about something very specific. The way that I work is I like to have, when I see a problem, I don't, want to become overwhelmed with the problem. I want to find a solution. So this contract is one tool that solves some problems within the art world, but I, I personally, why I'm so excited about it. I don't have a legal background. I, you know, it's, this is much of this is very new for me personally, but I'm so excited by it because it extends into so many different aspects of my life as an artist, you know, sales do not happen, as I mentioned, frequently for me. However, now I think about contracts in every, in every exchange, whether it's I'm being hired as an artist, you know, making sure that I'm on the same page, uh, negotiating and asking for things that I think are fair to me, um, rather than just going, I had to deal with that again, but you know, whatever, because I got a show out of it or, and just feeling like I'm being walked on all the time. And I'm, because I'm so desperate, and that's kind of, when I started this, that was the feeling that I was alluding to and I are being very direct about, but so many of my artist peers, I get that same sense, this feeling of helplessness and um, not feeling like they have the tools to, to do something like have a contract, even know how to go about it, or even at a more fundamental level that they can ask for these things, whether or not you care about resale royalties or not flipping is that's one piece of the puzzle, but knowing that you have rights that you as an artist can ask for and advocate for on your own behalf. That's if I can convey one message to you, I'm, I'm hoping that's it. That's what Susan really conveyed when she did her first workshop. Um, uh, with me is that, you know, it's, your work has value. You're putting so much time and money and resources into it. And it's hard for us as artists to really advocate for that. Um, but it has value and your work, you should protect it. Getting off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I, I really appreciated that, Virginia. And that's, I think, what <clears throat> um, attracted me to your project and what got the county excited about it is this notion of, you know, um, artists supporting artists for the change that they want to see. And, and, you know, in turn, how the public agencies can support you all in the kinds of uh, policies that you want to put forward and the types of regulations that you want to see. Um, because I think, you know, as you're talking, it's not only about advocating for yourself. When you advocate for yourself and your own artwork, you're also then advocating for other artists' rights over time. There's um, another question about that uh, is related to copyright and social media. Um, are there, is there any relationship between uh, copyright and what happens on display privileges with social media? Are there any laws on social media designed to protect the artist and their photographs? Um, does, does this contract play, is there any overlap in uh, copyright and our contracts and social media? Okay, social media uses smart contracts. And when you sign the terms of service, when you click, I agree, you're giving up all kinds of rights. Nobody reads all the contracts, but you have to if you're concerned about maintaining your copyright because some social media um, platforms um, will say that once you post your photographs or once you post your images of your work, they belong to that social media outlet and can be used freely. And that's really very scary for most people. Um, I know my nephew is a photographer and he has stopped using Facebook completely, won't post on Instagram um, because he has real concerns, mostly about Facebook, but he's read the terms of service. Um, and so all I can say is, the terms of service are a contract. If you're concerned about what happens to your artwork when it's posted, you should read the terms of service, even though it's a huge pain in the butt. There are a couple questions about, um, I guess, just logistics. So does the artist present the contract to a gallery or does the gallery present the contract to the purchaser of an artwork? Somebody else said that it seems like the gallery should negotiate the contracts on behalf of the artist um, since perhaps that's part of their 50% commission and they're handling the business. Um, maybe Susan, you can talk to that, but I, I wanted to mention one aspect that um, part of what to me also is exciting about this as somebody who is not represented by a gallery is that I don't need to rely on somebody else to handle what is really important, you know, have these terms that we're talking about. Um, we're hoping to, uh, to really give tools to artists um, who don't have that gallery representation because for, I would say the majority of artists don't have gallery representation. Um, but uh, as far as, who, who hands the contract to who, who asks for it. I mean, I, again, I think artists should always be setting the pace for here's my expectations, this is my contract, and you enter into a conversation which there may be some negotiation and maybe there are thing, terms you, you know, you give up and you ask for other things and there's a conversation, but um, I think you should, again, anytime, if you, if you wanna establish that you use um, a contract or our contract once it's drafted, making sure it's on your website and people know that you use um, your, your sales are subject to that. Uh, and also be the first person to ask for one and not wait for your gallery to suggest it or use theirs if you, if you have one that you wanna use, you know, be assertive. Um, but Susan, do you have any experience as far as, uh, or additional insight about what role the gallery should play? I mean, do you think that they should kind of lead the reins? Like, If you're lucky enough to have gallery representation, I would definitely discuss this with the gallery and suggest that they lead the way in your sales. A number of gallerists really supported artists back in the 70s who used the artist contract. Um, and 
there's no reason why your gallery shouldn't agree to use the contract now. I think right now the contract that we're drafting is geared towards artists who sell directly. I expect that a later iteration of the contract will be geared towards artists who work with galleries and that there may be some provision to sweeten the pot for the gallery so that they get something out of it when the work is resold and resale royalties are due to you. I uh, just noticed down in the in our Google Doc we have um, the the founder of someone who actually is create has created a blockchain um, title and authentication platform so similar to that one that I mentioned uh, Verisart it says uh, it looks like it's called the Fine Art Ledger. Um, and so this is another tool on the blockchain. So um, again, like the blockchain is kind of over my head in a lot of ways. I know that it's like on the internet and it's secure. That's about as far as I can go. But I know that it's important because everyone we talk to about this says it's really important so that there's like the secure documentation that you can track your contracts and make sure that they're uh, secure, connected to the artwork, and so that that is a piece of the puzzle in making sure that they are enforceable. So there's another resource in the document for, um, I'll be looking at that later, maybe you all want to take a look at it um, and look into these platforms. They're popping up, um, all different kinds are popping up, all different resources uh, that I had no clue, you know, that anyone needed. Um, but because of these issues, because of the lack of transparency in the art world, because of skepticism about people really doing what they say they're doing, there, there are all of these new um, uh, companies, tools, resources, people that are trying to create um, ways for us to operate better, that are, it's just better for everybody because it's not so <laughs> obscured and hidden and um, under the table and unprofessional. <laughs> After we started this project, I reached out to about 48 different blockchain art registries, which had started up between 2015 and 2016. And uh, with the exception of a handful, almost all of them were gone. And um, it was explained to me that when they started, the blockchain registries were seen as a investment vehicle that would quickly become profitable. And that after a year or two, when most of them did not turn a profit, they were abandoned. Um, there are some that still exist and we've just learned of another, which I'm very excited about. Um, if we could have this as a practice where artists are allowed to choose their contract terms, enter into smart contracts, have those contracts preserved on the blockchain, and then have the transactions go through the website so that if the contract is adhered to, title passes, and if it's not adhered to, title doesn't pass. If we could have a way for the registry or the site to automatically send out a letter to the collector saying, oh, we see you're selling the work, Remember that your resale royalty has to be paid. That would be tremendous. These are the things that are becoming possible and that I hope will become widely accepted as a way of doing business in the art world in the next few years. I'm gonna answer a handful of questions. Um, so again, so we are drafting a new contract that it's a sales agreement it will be free for anyone to use. Um, there is a draft already available on Susan's website. The link is in the, our shared documents. Um, if you wanna check it out, it's not complete yet. Um, we are aiming to have it ready at the beginning of 2021, which will be the 50th anniversary from the 1971 uh, Artists Reserved Rights Transfer and Sale Agreement. Um, so we, Susan identified that ah, this 50th anniversary is coming up and you know we should update it. So that's happening. Again, it will be free. Um, and uh, there's, um, there's a question about um, 
would the contracts be used for galleries purchasing your art or just collectors? It's a sales agreement. So it's between the seller and the purchaser. So whoever's purchasing the work um, and the seller, the, whether that's the artist, if the gallery owner is buying it, um, if it's a private collector. Um, <clears throat> again, the contract will be free. Um, we're hoping to have it available in different ways, um, like a smart contract, um, a paper copy, uh, it's all still um, being worked out, but Susan's well on the way of having the draft pretty, pretty finalized. Um, there is another question about, can you adopt this new contract and like go back and have somebody sign it? I don't think that is a practice that's really done or would work, would it Susan? If even if somebody said yes to signing it, would that work? If a collector agreed to retroactively enter into the agreement, that would be fine, but you can't force someone to do it after the work is already sold. And it would have to be an act of goodwill um, on their part. And, you know, again, you know, we're, this, this workshop and this presentation is for specifically for artists. And um, we're sort of trying to lead the charge with artists because again, I think artists are usually the last to ask for uh, enforcing their rights or even some benefits to them. But ultimately this isn't, we're not doing this to take away from anybody else. You know, hopefully this will be um, an effort that's in partnership with collectors, with artists who have dealers, where they see the value for everyone because we're all participating in hopefully increasing the value of the work, getting everybody to benefit from it, you know, providing the, a legacy, you know, having provenance of the work, having great records so that when you have your retrospective, it's easy to track everything down and you can have an amazing exhibition. You know, all of these things, they, they're, they're, it's, it's not because it's not to try to steal something away that, you know, you think is yours and somebody else is going to be losing out. Hopefully this will create better partnerships for everyone involved. And you know, in ideal world, the collectors and the artists are, you know, on good terms so that again, you know, if a repair is needed or um, the artist says, hey, somebody reached out to me and they're doing a museum retrospective. Can we, you know, can I connect you to have the work in the show? Um, and Susan, I think, didn't you say that with the 1971 um, agreement, most of the gallerists were on board, right? Um, For the artists who used the contract, most of their gallerists were on board. Yeah. So, you know, I, the, the first time, um, I'll just tell a quick story. So a month ago or so, somebody referred me to a fundraiser. They were asking for me to donate a piece to a fundraiser, which I don't normally do, but I was okay with it. And I decided to, to be okay to donate a piece to this fundraiser. And, and I asked, I, I was trying to decide if I was going to ask if I could use a version of the contract that we're drafting for if somebody purchased my work. And I was talking with my other friends who were invited to the fundraiser. And I said, you know, maybe you should use it. I don't know if I'm going to use it. Should I ask for the contract? And we were kind of going back and forth. And um, one of my friends wasn't comfortable asking for it. I did ask for the contract. It was no problem. The, the dealer said, yeah, sure, great. We'll figure it out. You know, send me the language you want me to include. I gave them the blurb. Um, I had a draft of the contract and it was not, there was no um, resistance to the idea. So um, I think getting over that hurdle of just starting to make it a practice of asking for a contract is uh, a, a huge piece of the puzzle that if artists just start asking for contracts, it will push us a lot forward. <laughs> All right, we've got a few more minutes. I'm gonna take a look to see if there are other questions here. Um, you should, you know, if you wanna bookmark this document, save it however you want to so you can refer back to it. If there are questions that we didn't answer, we will go through the document after um, this. And I shouldn't say we, Susan will answer <laughs> most of the questions with her legal expertise. Um, in our past workshops, she's been very generous about that and answered everyone's questions, you know, even if we addressed it uh, while we're talking here. Um, there are resources in there that you can also add to if there are things that we didn't 
touch on um, that you want to mention. Um, I will, uh, I have created a PDF toolkit for you all. Um, so there are two ways you can receive it. Um, I think uh, Brianna can send out uh, to everyone who signed up, can receive it via email. Um, if you are inclined, I would recommend that you sign up for my mailing list at theartistoffice.net because I will be continuing to add to the PDF and we will be continuing to send out updates on the artist contract and the new draft for 2021. So if you get on my mailing list, um, I don't send out a lot of emails, but you will be kept up to date on uh, when that's gonna be available, if we do any other presentations, um, you know, if I had pass out a survey, um, then you'll already be included on that. And I will send everybody the PDF that way too. So that link is in the shared Google doc. It's theartistoffice.net. And again, if you wanna just sign up to my mailing list, thank you. Um, um, what else am I missing? Is there anything? Um, well, first of all, I wanna thank Brianna and the County of Los Angeles for, um, for having us and also for sponsoring um, all of the initiatives that are attempting to bring better practices to artists and actually starting a conversation with artists. Um, I, I think it's generous and forward thinking and I'm very grateful. Um, and then I also wanted to say that please put your questions in the Google Doc. Um, I will come back to it within a week and answer everyone's questions. I will not give individual legal advice. This is for general information purposes only, but insofar as your question is one that is a general question, um, I'm more than happy to give you an answer. And I hope that again, you'll all stay in touch, whether you, if you can sign up for the mailing list just so you can be kept up to date, but you can also find me on social media. Um, and I'm trying to post more information as I come across it and things that are useful to me in using contracts and um, sort of all of the expanded topics that spin off of this idea. Um, it's, I'm learning as I go and I get, you know, I'm excited to share with people. Um, you know, we're here on a Monday evening and we've got such a solid group of uh, people staying here to, to listen to this uh, conversation on contracts. I'm really excited by the artist community here. Um, I hope that we have the opportunity to meet in person at some point in the future um, and I can become familiar with all of your work. Uh, please stay in touch if you like. Um, I would love that and uh, I'm looking forward to, to future chances, chances to cross paths. Um, thank you, Susan, for all of your hard work. And thank you, Brianna, for organizing it, for, again, for supporting this initiative and giving us the platform to talk about it. Is there anything else you want to say before we sign off? Um, no, well, just a big thank you to you, Virginia and Susan. Um, it's such a pleasure talking with you always. And I, I was fortunate to catch one of the earlier um, presentations that they offered and I was just blown away by um, the just the enthusiasm and the great insights from the audience. So um, we're super happy to be collaborating with you at the county level um, and look forward to offering more of these workshops and other workshops um, which Susan was alluding to, there, there's gonna be a lot more coming down the, the pipeline. We've been very delayed with um, all the things happening over these past eight months. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, different um, timelines and priorities had to, had to shift accordingly. But we look forward to offering more um, artist-centered, artist-led initiatives moving into the new year. So we'll definitely be in touch about all of those things and more. So. Thank you all. Uh, and I'm going to just end it here. And well, are there any last minute questions? I think we've probably been through it all. So maybe we'll just. Yeah, type them in that Google Doc and um, and uh, keep it, keep the, if you want to save it to your, to your drive so you can access it. Um, 
that's the that's the best way to keep going with this conversation after after we end here tonight. Great, and look forward to some some emails from us as follow up. So, good night, everybody. Thank good night, you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.